So let's now discuss what's called the hypophysial portal system, which is also referred to as the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system or the hypothalamo hypophysial portal system. For the sake of simplicity, we are going to refer to it as the hypophysial portal system. And what this represents is the relationship between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary or the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Once again, what I would recommend that you do is look for the optic chiasm or optic chiasma. That way you know what's anterior versus posterior. So we'll begin our discussion of the hypophysial portal system by looking at blood flow in and out of this system. So blood enters this hypophysial portal system at the superior hypophysial artery. This is a branch off of the internal carotid artery. From there, blood will flow into the primary plexus of the hypophysial portal system. This primary plexus is a capillary bed. Remember, capillaries represent the site of exchange. Then, blood flows into the hypophysial portal veins, and we have two of them. And it leads us into the secondary plexus of the hypophysial portal system, which is another capillary bed. Once again, the site of exchange. Then blood leaves the anterior pituitary through the anterior hypophysial veins. So these veins will converge, eventually converging into the internal jugular vein, ultimately into the superior vena cava and back to the right side of the heart specifically the right atrium. Now, one thing I want to point out, these blood vessels are part of the systemic circuit. So these are systemic blood vessels, not pulmonary blood vessels. So let's now look at the neurosecretory or neuroendocrine cells found in the hypothalamus. And once again, they are a neuron with the exception of not secreting neurotransmitters. Instead, they secrete neurohormones. So we have two regulatory hypothalamic hormones. We have the hypothalamic releasing hormone, or RH, and the hypothalamic inhibiting hormone, or IH. So once again, these are regulatory hormones that will regulate the secretion of the endocrine cells found in the anterior pituitary. So these neurosecretory cells will secrete RH and IH. So what I'm illustrating right now is the secretion of these hypothalamic regulatory hormones, RH and IH. These regulatory hormones will then end up in blood, and this is why it's a hormone and not a neurotransmitter. So remember, the site of exchange happens at the capillary. Therefore, RH and IH enters blood through this primary plexus of the hypophysial portal system. From there, blood flows into the hypophysial portal veins on their way to the anterior pituitary. Upon arrival at the anterior pituitary, this RH and IH will leave the secondary plexus of the hypophysial portal system. Remember, this secondary plexus is another capillary bed. So once again, RH and IH will leave blood and will now enter the interstitial fluid. Now, why the interstitial fluid? Why doesn't RH and IH remain in blood? It is because their target cells, endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary, are not found inside the blood vessel. They're not found in blood. They're found in the interstitial fluid. Just so that we're absolutely clear on how this works, let's look at the illustration that I did down below. And once again, this is now at the anterior pituitary. So we have this secondary plexus, we have this capillary bed found in the anterior pituitary. So once again, RH and IH will leave blood. Why do they have to leave blood? Because their target cells are the endocrine cells found in the anterior pituitary. So let's specifically look at RH, the releasing hormone. Now that they're in the interstitial fluid because they've left blood, they've left the blood vessel, the capillary, the secondary plexus to be specific, it will then bind to its receptor. 
So what I'll do is I'll illustrate RH with this dot. So this dot, blue dot, is RH. So RH has now bound to its receptor. Where is this receptor present? Well, it's present on the endocrine cells. Where are these endocrine cells found? At the anterior pituitary. So now that this RH, this releasing hormone, binds to its receptor, what is the effect on this endocrine cell? Remember, a hypothalamic releasing hormone stimulates the endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary to secrete hormones. So let's say it secretes hormone A, okay? And why does it secrete hormone A? Is because once again, RH binds to its receptor, the RH receptor that's present on this endocrine cell, which again is found in the anterior pituitary. So hormone A secreted by this endocrine cell will now enter the secondary plexus. In other words, it's now in blood. This is why A is a hormone, is because it enters blood. It does not stay in the interstitial fluid. If it did, then it would not be called a hormone. So once hormone A produced by the endocrine cell enters the secondary plexus, it is now officially in blood. So let me try and illustrate this out in my diagram and we'll do something like this. So what I'll do is I'll highlight these endocrine cells found in the anterior pituitary just so that it stands out. And what I'll do is I'll do something like that, okay? So from the interstitial fluid where we find the endocrine cells, it secretes hormone A. Now hormone A enters blood. It is now officially called a hormone. Now it's not just going to stay there it will circulate because now it's officially in the circulatory system. And hormone A will leave the anterior pituitary through these anterior hypophyseal veins. And then ultimately back to the heart it goes. And now the heart will pump it systemically. So what I'd like to do is look at this diagram that I illustrated right here, okay? Just so that it's absolutely clear because I understand this could be rather confusing. So let's say the releasing hormone binds to its receptor. Remember, this is a hypothalamic hormone. The fact that RH has attached to its receptor, this endocrine cell will now secrete a hormone, right? So it secretes a hormone. Remember, these regulatory hormones are controlling the secretions of these endocrine cells. But what if IH binds to its receptor on this endocrine cell? What is the effect on this endocrine cell? Well, if IH binds to its receptor, rather than producing a hormone or secreting a hormone, instead, no hormone is secreted. Why? Because it is an inhibiting hormone. One last thing I'd like to mention before we move on to the next slide is where the location of the primary plexus and the secondary plexus would be. So the primary plexus, the capillary bed, will be found specifically at the infundibulum, while the secondary plexus, which is another capillary bed, will be found in the anterior pituitary, and it surrounds these endocrine cells of the anterior pituitary. Let's now talk about the hypophyseal tract, which is also referred to as the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract, or the hypothalamo-hypophyseal tract. And what this represents is the relationship between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. Now, remember that the posterior pituitary is an extension of the hypothalamus. So let's first look at the blood flow in and out of this hypophyseal tract. So blood enters the posterior pituitary at the inferior hypophyseal artery. And this inferior hypophyseal artery is an extension or a branch of the internal carotid artery, just like the superior hypophyseal artery. From there, blood flows into the capillary plexus of the infundibular process. So this is, again, another capillary bed found in the posterior pituitary, 
From the capillary plexus, blood then drains out of the posterior pituitary through the posterior hypophysial veins. So these posterior hypophysial veins will ultimately converge into the internal jugular vein and eventually the superior vena cava and the right atrium of the heart. So let's look at another set of neurosecretory cells found in the hypothalamus. This time, these cells are clustered into nuclei. We have the supraoptic nuclei and the paraventricular nuclei. If you remember what a nucleus represents, it is a cluster of cell bodies within the central nervous system. If this were in the peripheral nervous system, then they would be referred to as a ganglia. So the supraoptic nuclei represents a cluster of cell bodies containing neurosecretory cells with long axons. So these axons are long because they have to reach into the posterior pituitary. Another nucleus is the paraventricular nuclei. And this is once again where we have a cluster of cell bodies and these neurosecretory cells will have long axons reaching into the posterior pituitary. Now, if we bundle these axons, and because we're in the central nervous system, then we would refer to this as a track. If this were in the peripheral nervous system, then the bundle of axons would be called a nerve. And this track is what we're going to find running through the infundibulum. So these neurosecretory cells of the supraoptic nuclei and the paraventricular nuclei will secrete two hormones, antidiuretic hormone ADH and oxytocin, which we can abbreviate as OXT. So they will release these neurohormones ADH and oxytocin that will now enter blood, therefore making these Hormones. Are they considered neurohormones? Yes, they are. Why? Because they're secreted by these neurosecretory cells or neuroendocrine cells of the hypothalamus. So these hormones will now enter the capillary plexus of the infundibular process. So these hormones now are officially in blood. Then the hormones will leave the posterior pituitary through the posterior hypophysial veins that eventually will converge into the internal jugular vein and then ultimately back to the heart, where the heart will now pump it systemically. Will there be any endocrine cells found in the posterior pituitary as what we saw for the anterior pituitary? The answer is no. So as far as the posterior pituitary is concerned, it does not produce any hormones. Why not? Because they do not contain any endocrine cells. So what I'd like you now to do is to carefully look at this image in this particular slide. So this shows us the relationship of the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland, both the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Remember that the relationship between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary is referred to as the hypophysial portal system, while the relationship between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary is referred to as the hypophysial tract. So what I'd like you to do is to carefully look at the blood vessels that we find not only in the infundibulum, but also found in both the anterior and posterior pituitary. I hope you can see that we have a total of three capillary beds. The primary plexus of the hypophysial portal system, the secondary plexus of the hypophysial portal system, and finally the capillary plexus of the infundibular process. So here's another image of the relationship of the hypothalamus and the posterior and anterior pituitary gland. And if we look at these neurosecretory neurons or neurosecretory cells or neuroendocrine cells, which are located in the hypothalamus, there is a difference as far as the length of their axons. So in other words, if we look at these neurosecretory cells, found in the hypothalamus, their axons are rather short. And why is that? 
because their axons do not reach into the anterior pituitary or the anterior lobe of the pituitary glands. Their axons need to be long enough to reach the primary plexus of the hypophysioportal system, allowing the releasing hormones and the inhibiting hormones to end up in blood. So once they enter the primary plexus of the hypophysial portal system, the blood now will enter the hypophysial portal veins, which reaches into the anterior pituitary, where we find another capillary bed called the secondary plexus of the hypophysial portal system. And these secondary plexus, this capillary bed surrounds the endocrine cells that we find in this anterior pituitary. So now the releasing and inhibiting hormones will leave the secondary plexus, will interact with these endocrine cells, once again found in the anterior pituitary. Now if we compare this to another group of neurosecretory cells, this time their cell bodies are clustered into two nuclei. So we have the supraoptic nuclei and the paraventricular nuclei. And if you look carefully, there's a difference in the length of their axons. Their axons have to be long enough to reach into the posterior pituitary gland or the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland, whereby they release ADH and oxytocin, which will end up in blood. What blood vessel will they end up in? Well, they'll end up in the capillary plexus of the infundibular process.